get the slideshow set up from current slide. All right, a couple of announcements first. Um, first, how many of you have done the student course evaluations? Everybody in team. Not, yes. not quite. Yeah, we have it. You have it, oh, okay. Have it. Yeah. yeah, please oh, get well, those done. I just get them all over the day. Yeah. Have and it, it didn't take long, did it? No. Okay, yeah. I have a question for you. Do you mind what social media is? No. I told you before, anything from the library would be fine, books, journals, newspaper, magazines, uh, but also you can use stuff from the internet as long as it's reliable. There's a lot of garbage out there, so I don't want to see any garbage, but you know, as long as it's a good reliable source. How many sources do we have to have? Uh, at least one, but two or more are better. And here is... Okay. I got you. Thanks. Okay, so please get your student course evaluations done sooner rather than later. Okay. Number two, uh, don't look for me on campus tomorrow. Normally I have office hours from uh, 7.45 to 11.45 on Fridays on the Birmingham campus. Not going to be there. I've got a treatment tomorrow, an infusion that's going to start sometime around 7-ish and end sometime probably around 4-ish. So there probably won't, no, there definitely won't be anywhere close to campus. David is here. Okay. And... Uh, all right, what's that? Next, okay, I've just doubled the number of papers that have been turned in by this class, okay? I got my second one, okay, so. <laughs> um, so please get your papers in. This is almost your last weekend to do it. You can turn it in that Tuesday after next week, but that's the very last day. So you've only got this weekend and Till Tuesday of the following. You, your choice. Anything to do with uh, physics, chemistry, physical science, anything to do with that. Your choice. And all that's explained. If you go to the web uh, blackboard under content, there's a, there's a, a, a file there on research paper general instructions or something like that. It's like the second or third thing in under content. Or you could go to the first, I think it is, of the uh, YouTube videos for this class. Uh, it probably says syllabus, but it has all the other stuff in it. And you can hear me talk about it, and I explain all that. So it's in two places out there you can see. Okay. Now, also, I started giving back some of the labs. Uh, still, let, let me just go through this quickly. Try to anyway. The first lab, first, I mean, the research paper, now two people have turned it in. First lab, there's still one, two, three, four, four people have it turned in the first lab. The first test, one, two, three people have it done, well, two people have it done the first test. Uh, second lab, I did return to everybody because, uh, that was here. I'll get it to you this afternoon. The only person that hasn't turned it in is Scotty, so I figure he's not coming back. Third lab, uh, there's another one, two people who haven't turned that in. So for just about every lab and every test, there's one or two people, not always the same ones, who have not turned it in. Now I want to get these back as soon as possible. I'm tired of carrying them around, uh, so get them to me. Melva's here. Uh, And uh, when you're doing your lab today, I'll probably uh, return some of the others to you if I have a chance. Good deal, thank you. Okay. All right. Let's see, any other things I need to say about that? Let's just talk about what today's going to be like. 
We're going to continue in chapter 6. This is electricity and magnetism. Uh, I imagine we'll get a fair amount of the rest of the chapter done. I sort of doubt we'll get the whole chapter because it's a pretty long chapter. But we'll get a fair amount done between now and 545. At 545 we start the lab, which is on flaw lab, and that will be, uh, it should be fairly quick. I couldn't get the lab set up because there's a biology lab in there when I got, but I put the equipment next door, and as soon as we can, I'll go out there and uh, when we get set up, if I can get a little help to get it all over there, then I'll get it uh, set up and we can get some work. It's going to look a lot like the last lab did, same equipment, but we're going to do different things with it this time. So, um, and a little bit more in different equipment. So we'll do that. You should be able to finish that well within the two hours, um, and then we'll go from there. Then Tuesday, I'm guessing we'll finish the chapter, and we'll have the third lab for electricity and magnetism, the last one, okay? We may get started on chapter eight, hope so, and uh, then we will, uh, that means Thursday we'll probably have the test on chapter six. Now if we finish the chapter six today, we'll have the test on chapter six on, on Tuesday. I'm kind of doubting we'll get that far, but we'll see. We might. Um, and then more than likely your last, we only have one lab in chapter eight, and there is a test in that chapter, and if there's time you can, we'll, you might actually get to do it before the final exam, but it more than likely the odds are it's going to be the same day as the final exam. The test is 30 minutes or less. The final exam is probably even shorter than that. It's just a one page, fairly quick, but comprehensive so final exam. What's that? Two tests in one day. Yeah, and that final. You were in the first <laughs> minute term. You know how easy the final was. It's just about that easy again. Okay. So yeah. Okay. Thank it. Okay. Now, any questions about how we're going to wind things up? Okay. Then let's get to going on. Any questions on Chapter 6 or anything beforehand? And like I say, please, folks, get your papers in, get your labs in, and arrange with me to take any test you may have missed. Because as of, I guess it's the Tuesday after next, you know, not next Tuesday, but the one after that, I'm returning everything to you. Anything not turned in by then is a big fat zero, okay? And by the way, today is the last day to get that one last bonus point on your papers. Uh, Justin, who turned it in today, you get your bonus point. Anyone who doesn't turn one in today, no more bonus points, you'll just get your score. Now, if you turn it in after that last day of class, which is a Tuesday, uh, right before your final on Thursday, then you start losing points. If you turn it in like with the final or the day before the final, something like that, you'll be losing points at that. All right, any questions? All right, I imagine most of you are probably pretty familiar with electrical resistance or at least with Ohm's law. What resistance is, electrical resistance, is loss of the electron current energy. You don't lose any current, okay? Just because you have more resistance, you don't lose current. Your current may be less than what it was before. The deal is it loses its energy. It expands its energy overcoming that resistance. Two sources, okay? Now, if you remember back a few slides ago, okay, this is what your electron actually looks like when it's traveling. It bumps, you know, it's attracted to a proton or a positive charge uh, thing, and then to another and another, but in the, along the way, it may bump into other electrons, very likely. They're all over the place there, and if it does, it recoils, okay? So there is one source, collisions with other electrons in the current, okay? That pushes them back because like charges do what? Repel, okay? Now, they could also collide with other charges in the material, 
Now let's go back to this one. Okay. When it does run into another positive charge, it may tend to hang around that, okay, because it's attracted to that. And it needs that electric field to keep it moving, okay? So if there's lots of charges, positive charges there, that could slow down the um, electron's progress. And of course, if it bumps into other electrons, that could recoil from there, okay? So those are the two sources of this resistance, collisions with other electrons in the current and collisions with other charges in the material. Now, the guy who came up with this concept was a German physicist named Georg Ohm, O-H-M. And he studied it extensively, saw that there was a uh, relationship there between the voltage and the current, and it was a direct relationship, and for different materials, um, he saw that it, it, it varied. The constant of proportionality there, he came up with and called it resistance. Okay? Now, since it was all who did it, what unit do you think they gave that resistance? Ohm. Ohm, okay, named it after him. So, what symbol do we use for an ohm? Capital R. Capital what? No, capital R is the parameter that's oh, okay. the you know, representing that, but what unit do we have? I may have said, I did say symbol. What unit do we use? We just call it ohm. How about capital zero? Would that be a good choice for the sub, for the unit? The symbol yeah. for the unit. Zero is a number and you can't capitalize. Uh, no, a capital O looks just like a zero. So if you had five yeah. ohms, someone would Seven think it was 50 something. What is that right horseshoe? Well, it looks like a horseshoe. Okay, so anyone omega. know what it is? Omega. It's an omega. In fact, it's a capital omega. Oh, so the since they is? couldn't have anything that would be in the English alphabet that wouldn't look like a zero, they went to the Greek alphabet. Now the letter in the Greek alphabet that most corresponds to O is Omicron. But Omicron looks just like an O, so that's no better than an O would be. But the Greek alphabet does have two letters that start with O. The one that follows mu and nu, like M and N, is omicron. That doesn't work. But the very last letter in the Greek alphabet is omega. And since so that's sort of an O, that is the capital. And by the way, because it's a person, that's the capital omega. All right. Now, um, I don't know if y'all are familiar with the Greek alphabet at all, but one way to know or think of uh, that being the last letter, if you've ever heard the expression, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, <coughs> the omega is the end, alpha is the beginning of the Greek alphabet. So that's omega. Okay, now the units for this, what's the units for voltage? This is capital parameter v. v. Yeah, it's also volts. It's a capital V also. The unit for current? Capital Now that's the symbol for it. What's the unit for it? Amperage. Amp. So that's a capital A because it's named after Louis Amperia. Okay? And the Volta was named, Volt was named after uh, Alessandro Volta. Okay? And the resistance is Ohm, named after Georg Ohm. Okay? Now, you can rearrange this formula at least two different ways. Here's one way, divide both sides by R, you get I is equal to V over R. What's the third way? R equals I over V, or no, V over I. V over I, exactly. R is equal to V over I. I'll go on and write that down. Uh, for those who aren't here, you can see this if they are watching it. Let me get my pen activated here. Okay, uh, R is equal to V over I. Now this was actually the first uh, example I can remember having. I think it was in Navy school that uh, they were telling us about the triangles of the circle. Works perfectly. 
B on top, I and R on the bottom, and whichever you're trying to solve for, cover that, and you'll have V is equal I times R, I is equal B over R, R is equal B over I. Okay. Now, physicists are understandably a little strange, okay? And here's an illustration of just how strange they are, or just one illustration. <clears throat> Resistance is that tendency to resist the flow of current in a circuit, right? Now, the opposite of that would be conductance, the ease at which a circuit or a material conducts, you know, uh, a current. So it's actually the reciprocal of resistance, okay? Now, when they were talking about conductance, they already had so many things that were beginning with C. C was used as so many uh, uh, parameters and, and units and stuff. They didn't really want to use C. Uh, uh, C had been overused a lot. So they had to come up with a unit, not a, yeah, a unit to express uh, conductance. Now, what unit do you think they would use? Anyone know? The unit for conductance. And conductance is the reciprocal of resistance. So that would be, uh, um, I just have the word in my head in that time. Conductance. I'm thinking about it. Okay. I had it. Are you thinking of inductance? No, I'm no. thinking of conductance. I had the word a minute left. Me. Okay. I'll tell you what it is. Okay. It's a mode. Okay. Has anyone ever heard of a mode? Yeah. Why would they name it a mode? That was the unit they decided to use to measure conductance. Is it named after someone? No. It's the reciprocal of resistance. What's the unit for resistance? Omega? No, that's the symbol. What's this, the... the what, R. Yeah, but what is the word? The, the unit oh, for... Ah-ha-ha-ha! Oh. <laughs> what they did, they spelled on backwards. Physicists are really Wait, strange. What? The, the unit for resistance is ohm, so the unit for conductance, which is reciprocal of that, they just spelled it backwards. <laughs> a mode. Okay? So many modes. Okay? Now, you thought it was Larry and Curly, but no, that wasn't what it had to do with at all. Okay? Now, what symbol would they use for a mode? Goodness gracious, we've already got so many... Uh, M symbols, meters and mega and milli, and we just have M's out the, the, the ears here. What symbol could they use for a mode? You have guessed it right. It's an upside down. It's not a symbol at all. That's in nobody's alphabet because it's reciprocal. They just flipped it over and made it a mode. That is the unit for uh, conductance. Now, you're not responsible for that. That was just a little freebie, no extra charge, okay? So, that's what resistance is. Now, here's a little bit more about resistance. Several things contribute to resistance, okay? One thing is a type of material, okay? Some materials are far more resistant than others. In fact, silver is the very best conductor we have, very low resistance, whereas iron is far worse, okay, conductor, a higher resistance. Aluminum, a little bit better than silver. Copper, better than, uh, not as, I'm sorry, I said it backwards. Copper, just not quite as good as as silver, aluminum not quite as good as, as copper, and you go on down the list, okay? Um, so the type of material 
That's one of the factors in determining your resistance. Okay? In fact, how you measure that is resistivity. Okay. The other thing, one other thing, is the length of the material. The longer the resistor is, the more resistance it has. Okay? Now you probably have seen that evidence before. Uh, if you've ever uh, run water through a hose, but you've had to run it a long distance, and you connect one hose to another hose to another hose, and run it all down, so after a while you'll notice you don't get as much water pressure. Because the longer the hose is, the more resistance it is, and the weaker the flow of water out of the hose. I don't know if you've seen that, uh, but if you've ever have the opportunity to pay attention to that, you'll see, yeah, you get lower flow. Same thing with resistance of material. If it's going through a long resistor, there's going to be more resistance. Okay? Another is cross-sectional area. In this, you can also think of your water pipe. If you had a very, okay, think of this. I see you've got a drink there with a straw, right? Have you ever uh, gone to one of the fast food places or something like that and got the hot coffee in the morning and had the little bitty stir that you can sip it through because it's so hot. Okay? Imagine trying to drink a milkshake through one of those. The odds are you're going to pop your ears you know, trying to suck the milkshake up that. Because the smaller the diameter, the more resistance you have. In other words, the smaller the cross-sectional area, the more resistance you have. Okay? Same thing as we move water through a, a, a smaller capillary. Okay? Temperature is another thing that influences resistance. Okay? Now, some materials don't really vary much in temperature, but others do. So, temperature could be. What do you think the uh, relationship is there? Higher the temperature? The higher the resistance. Higher the resistance, exactly. What would be a possibility for that? The explanation for that? Okay, the electrons, the hotter it is, the more they're bouncing around. The other materials are, the harder the collisions and the more likely they are to be bounced back and, and, and uh, you have more trouble getting through. Okay, so sure enough, temperature is one too. Now, <clears throat> do any of you remember those old devices that were called incandescent light bulbs? Yeah. Probably, okay. Um, nowadays they've got fluorescence, contact fluorescence, they're now getting into LEDs. After a while there will be, probably I won't be teaching them a class where you say an incandescent light bulb, it'll say a lot, you know, because they may have never handled one. I don't even think they make them much anymore, do they? They do. They do, but uh, a lot of places don't sell nearly as many as they did before because they're selling the compact fluorescence and the LEDs. But think about that light bulb. Have you ever looked in one, especially one that was clear? What do you notice about the filament? Very thin. Very thin. Small cross-sectional area that gives you more resistance. Because in an incandescent light bulb, what you're doing, you're heating that filament, meaning cre creating a lot of resistance in the filament, and it gets so hot it glows. That's what produces the light. That's not what produces light in a fluorescent. That's not what produces light in an LED. In a, in a conventional incandescent light bulb, you're heating that filament so hot, it glows. And they're not very energy efficient, efficient because most of the energy is going to heat and not to light, okay? Whereas LED, very efficient, and even the compact fluorescence, quite a bit better. Uh, efficiency than those. So one reason is the small cross-sectional area. Those filaments are probably about the thickness of a hair, okay, for those who have it. Okay, so uh, cross-sectional area. What's another thing you notice about those filaments? The what? Okay, the material certainly is different. You know what the material, I, I don't know if all of them use, but the original material. Who, who is responsible, who is given credit for developing the first successful light bulb? Thomas 
Thomas Edison, okay? And Thomas Edison, he was dogged in his pursuit of getting things done. One time someone said, and by the way, he had probably, I think he probably set the record for the number of patents by any single individual. He had, I think, hundreds of them. Now, maybe someone else has some minor things, but I mean, he had them, you know, just lots of things that he had patents for. <coughs> but he worked <coughs> so hard to get those things. Someone asked him one time, wow, to what do you attribute your <coughs> brilliance and your success in coming up with all these devices? And his quote was something like, well, it's about 1% brilliance and 99% persistence. And that's a really pretty accurate thing. He tried everything over and over. Finally, he came up with a material that would get hot, had a lot of resistance, would get hot enough, glowed, and it glowed fairly white. Other things might glow yellowish or other colors that weren't very. He finally found that it was tungsten. Okay, really? yeah, that's what he used in the filament, tungsten. So yeah, the type of material. Tungsten has a far higher resistance than copper. Yeah, <laughs> to heat a copper wire high enough to get it to uh, to glow, you're going to be putting enormous amount of current through it. Small amount of current would have the uh, tungsten had enough resistance it would get hot enough to glow. What else? Think of the filaments you've seen when you've had those clear glass bulbs and look at the filament. You mentioned that it was very small diameter. What else do you notice about it? It's twisted. Right? Aha! It's a helix. It's a little spring looking device in there, right? And think about that. If you had taken that thing and stretched it out, it would be pretty long. So you also took advantage of the length, took advantage of the type of material, tungsten has a high resistance or resistivity. The length of the material, they made it into a coil. And sometimes they'll go from one pole to another pole to another. So yep. it actually goes around. And every one of those is a very tightly wound little frame looking thing. OK? Now, another thing to note about those incandescent bulbs. Have you ever had one blow out on you? When does it usually happen? When it kind of breaks. OK, yeah, when it breaks. That's what happens. But when? When most of the time do those blow out on you? When you're turning them on. When you first turn them on. Have you ever noticed that? Because it's heat. not that. You, yes. Okay, why? Change of heat. The change of heat. Change of temperature. Okay, almost. Temperature. Change, change of temperature. Okay. Okay. Because at the lowest temperature, which would be when you first turn it on, it has less resistance, right? Yes. Less resistance, more current. And if that filament has gotten to be a little bit, you know, worn and stuff like that, then that big current surge is going to pop it. Most of the time, it's not when it's been on for a while, and then suddenly it goes out. Most of the time, it's when it's cold, when it has the biggest current surge, because it has less resistance then. Right when you turned it off last time, when it got that thin before, it had a higher temperature, so it had more resistance. So that thin wire ready to break when you surge a lot of current through it when it's cold, that's when it's blue. Most of the time that's how it happens. Now, this is a strength, and here's an illustration of what we're talking about too. The length, the type of material, the temperature, I don't know why they put it there, and the cross-sectional area, all those things are uh, factors in creating your resistance. Now, this looks like they should have done a different slide, but here they put it on this one. There are some materials called superconductors. Really rather strange materials. I, I haven't looked up to see, but uh, it seems like to me just about the most number of Nobel Prizes have been won in physics on one topic. It would have to be pretty close to being superconductors. Because they somebody first hypothesized that they could have them and actually came up with a superconductor, and that person got a, a Nobel Prize, and somebody else 
improved and came up with a different material. It was so much better. That person got, so there's been several of them that actually got the Nobel Prize in physics because they kept improving this technology. Now, they say negligible resistance. They don't really say zero resistance, but it's almost like there's no resistance, but it's at very low temperatures. And here's the surprising thing. What do you think might be a good material to try as a superconductor? What's one of your best conductors? Silver. Say again? Silver. Silver is the best. Copper is really good. Silver is really expensive. They don't work well in superconductors. Carbon. Okay, it will be some sort of, it's usually something really bizarre that's not really of that great of a conductor at normal temperatures, but when you drop it to a very low temperature, suddenly it becomes a superconductor. Most of them have been really strange materials. Gallium oxide or something like that. So uh, things that you wouldn't normally use at all. Okay, so superconductors are strange materials sometimes. But when you drop them at very low temperatures where they had you know, not great resistance uh, before, suddenly it goes nearly to zero. Now, does anyone know some uses of superconductors? Spacecraft. Say again? Spacecraft. Oh, really? I didn't know. Do they use it in it? Well, I would guess because yes, they're going to have space. Yeah, and it's cold, yeah. Uh, actually, Japan is fairly famous for using them for something. Japan has some very high-speed trains. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, what is the one of the biggest problems with getting up a large speed? Say again? Well, stopping is a problem with it, but just getting to the speed. What is one of the big limitations in your car in speed, getting up to high speed? Drag. Drag, exactly. Okay. Resistance. Okay. Aerodynamics and that kind of stuff. And frankly, where the rubber meets the road, there's always resistance there. You felt of a tire after it's been driven for uh, you know, an hour on a hot summer's day in the, uh, on the interstate. That's almost hot enough to burn your hand. Okay. You know, there's a lot of friction there. So, uh, what the Japanese have done is taken superconductors, they literally elevate the trains by magnetism with a superconductor because the superconductor kept at very low temperatures, a moving current create, we're going to see this later in the chapter, a strong magnetic field. And they can actually use it to elevate so that the, the super high speed trains are basically running above the track, not really on the track. But that's, I mean, rather clever, okay? Uh, the problem is the very, very low temperatures. The earliest ones they came out with were down around, it seems like maybe three to five K, wow. which is incredibly cold. To get something that cold, you're expending an enormous amount of energy to get it that cold. But then they came up with other materials that were be superconductors at much warmer temperatures, like 35 to 65, you know, still awfully cold, but not nearly as bad as, as the, the earlier ones. And the slower, the higher they can get that temperature to still be a superconductor, trying different materials, then uh, the more practical the uses are. You don't have to get things as cold to use them. So, and whenever you have a moving charge, in other words, a conductor, and by the way, on these, you basically put the voltage across it, get the electrons moving, remove the voltage. There's no more energy draw. It just keeps moving and, and creates that strong magnetic field with no new input, you know, to speak of. Pretty incredible. All right. Before we move into electric power and work, goodness gracious, I need a slide. Here's one. Okay, let's do example 6.3. A light bulb in a 120 volt circuit. What's a 120 volt circuit? What does that represent? Your volts, okay. <laughs> Remember, that's the one that the parameter is the same as the unit. That's the only one we have like that. That's your voltage. 
Voltage is potential difference. Okay? Now, when you see a volt of around 120 volts, what you better be thinking? AC. You seldom, if ever, will have a DC. I, I can't imagine a direct current with that big a voltage. You can have much higher voltage with AC than you will ever do with DC. So that's probably an AC circuit, and it is. That's typically what our uh, voltages and normal household usage. Now, if you're over in Europe or some lots of other places, they usually use 240s, okay, as their normal household or something close to it. Uh, whereas we use 240 for things like anything that produces a lot of heat, dryers, ovens, uh, air conditioning systems. You know, those things are usually your 240. Okay. All right. So there's a hundred and 20 volts circuit is switched on. The light bulb in a 120 volt circuit is switched on and a current of 0.5 amps flows through the filament. So 0 0.5, was it 50? Yeah, 50 amps. What's that a measure of? Current. current. And what's the symbol for current? Amps. Uh, no, that's a unit for current. I is the symbol for current, okay? Why it's capital I, I have no idea, okay? It might be a good paper topic if you want to check that out, okay? Now, all they say is what is the resistance to the bulb, okay? What is the resistance? That's the question. One divided by Say again? One point divided by point five. Okay. It's, uh, the resistance is voltage divided by current, which is 120.0 volts, divided by 0 0.50 amps. Okay. And what? there's a, several ways you could do it. My preference would be double both the numerator and denominator. That gives you one in the denominator, and that would be 240. What unit for ohm? <laughs> for resistance? Ohms. Ohms. Ohm. Okay, it's sort of like a chant. 240 ohms. Make sense? Yes. All right. 6.4. What current? So this time we're looking for current. There's your unknown would flow through an electrical device in a circuit with a potential difference of 120 volts. What's the symbol for potential difference? Symbol for pot potential difference? We just had it. Symbol? It's right on the page, just a little bit higher up. That's your voltage. Potential difference is your voltage. Same unit, same letter for the symbol and the unit. One of the few ones that does that. And a resistance of 30 ohms. So your R is here of 30 ohms. Okay, did they do it? Yeah, no point zeros or anything. So how much current would flow through that uh, resistor? How would you do that? How would you do that? V divided by R. Okay, I is equal to V over R, and your V was 120 volts. Again, that's probably AC, and your resistor was 30 ohms, and that would give you... Uh, zeros cancel out. Uh, four amps. And by the way, folks, that's a lot of current. I think in most of your automobiles, you measure things in milliamps, don't you? The currents? Okay, so four amps, that's a lot. That's 4,000 milliamps, so they, you don't run into that much. Well, the reason is that's a really low resistance. If you've got that much voltage, you're going to be producing a lot of current. Whereas the light bulb, the filament, and that 240 ohms is not that great of resistance, so that gets you only half an amp. So, yeah, that's a huge amount of current. We're not going to 
have any four amps in the lab. That would be burning out thing pretty quickly. Okay. So there was example 6.3 and 6.4. Any questions on that? All right. Let's go. All right. Now we're ready for electric, electrical power and electrical work. What's the difference in power and work? Same thing or different? We had it back in chapter 3. Power and work mean the same thing or not? How are they related? Okay, see a shaking head, no, not the same thing. So how are they related? Are they related at all? Remember my digging in the backyard. Say then. You did the lab with the walking and running the stairs. Whether you walk up the stairs or run up the stairs, guess what? You're doing the same amount of work. What's the difference? The power. The what? The power. Okay, the power and what influences the power? Time. The time, exactly. Power is the time rate of doing work. Okay? Remember, we I say this over and over again. As soon as we get something that we find useful in physics, usually you turn around, well, let's do the time rate of change of it and see what we get then. Well, if we had work or energy, the time rate of change of doing work or providing energy or expending energy, that's what power is. The time rate of change of work or energy. So, three circuit elements contribute to work. Your voltage source. The higher the voltage, the more work you can do, the more energy you provide. Because what is a volt? Does anyone remember what a volt is? The units for a volt. Huh? It's volt, but what is that? Broken into more smaller pieces. A volt is energy per charge of joules per coulomb okay so this is where you get your energy is from the voltage source now what does the electrical device do it's what okay it uses it okay it consumes it that's what the electrical device does that's where you expend your work or energy and then your other thing is your conducting wires. If you don't have the conducting wires there, you have no potential difference. Okay? That maintains the potential difference, which is the voltage across the device. The input wire is always at a higher percent potential than the output wire. Okay? All right. The output wire is often called the ground. And I know y'all like to use the term ground in AC circuits. In DC circuits, you can still use that concept, but really, DC circuits is complete flow. AC circuit, it goes to ground. Okay? The, uh, have you ever wondered why I wish it did when you see birds up on a high power, high uh, voltage power line? Yes. Because they're not touching the ground. Yes, they have no path to ground. That's why they don't get electrocuted. Okay? Now, uh, sort of a dumb example. The, yeah, okay, you got it. Transformers. Okay, yeah, uh, squirrels and transformers, we've had that happen in our neighborhood before. Fried squirrel immediately. Okay. But we actually had something else that happened. We had a dog, our first dog after we got married. Uh, she was a lab uh, golden retriever mix. She was one very smart dog, too smart, okay? And we had a fairly small backyard. She didn't like being in the backyard. She wanted, she was a front yard dog. She was not supposed to be a backyard dog. So once she got old enough to do it, she managed 
to get out whenever she wanted to. Now, the first way she did it, like I said, she was a pretty clever dog. I had a gate on there, you know, to, to close in the backyard, and she found out if she nudged that latch with her nose, she could get it to flop up, and then she was out, okay? And she was also a retriever, both of her breeds were retrievers, so how we knew we were out, that she had gotten out that day, when we came home, everything from the neighborhood had been retrieved to our yard, okay? We'd find trash, she would eat as much as she could, uh, we would find shoes, we would find toys, we would find just about everything scattered all over our front yard, and she, we said, she got out again, okay? So I started fixing the, putting a, a lock, you know, just a loop of a lock. I didn't lock it up, but through the gate so she couldn't push it up. Well, clever dog that she was, she uh, then began digging under the, the chain link fence. And she, big dog, I mean, 80 pounds or so. And yet she could get under, she could get just a little bit of, somehow she flattened herself out so flat that she could get under there. So I would drive uh, stakes down and, you know, staple them down and try to get it to hold in. She'd find ways out. So then I ran barbed wire along the bottom. Didn't bother her at all. It scratched her back. She liked it. I don't know. She, but that didn't work. Finally, one of our neighbors said, the only way you're going to keep her in, because everybody knew it was a running joke in the neighborhood, seeing all the trash in our yard, old case has been out again. Uh, so she said, the only way you're going to get her is to put an electric fence around her. Now, this little electric wire, uh, and put it just about nose level above the ground, so when she goes to go under, she's going to get shot. And so I did it about a foot off the ground, uh, maybe a little less than a foot while she was going under. So maybe six to eight inches off, you know, so grass couldn't short it out, but you know, just low enough that she would get a shot. And I came home one day, and there was a squirrel. You know, it had reached a, not very much current, but just enough, and there was just hanging, and she just had a kill baby squirrel. But, once I got it off, you know, she wanted Now, our neighbor also said, look, all you have to do is hit her with it once, she'll never try it again. Maybe twice if she's a really stubborn dog. No, I never could turn that thing off. She would go up, we'd watch her sometimes, she'd go up to it, and we couldn't tell if she was actually listening to hear if the hum was on, or if she actually got her whisker close enough and then she'd do that. She knew exactly when that was on and when it wasn't. So I could never turn it off. These, the neighbor who told me about it said, once she gets a time or two, she'll never get close to it again. Not Casey. Now she did find another way that she liked better than putting, getting close to it and listening or getting a whisker, whatever she was doing. If I was working in the yard, like in the garden, we had to do it around the garden too, because she would go over the fence into the garden or under the fence into the garden and enjoy playing with the cantaloupes and the squash and stuff like that. Uh, she was pretty aggravating at times. So, if I was out there working in the yard and stuff, she would come up to me, that nice dog, who you know, wanted to get as close as possible and push me into the fence. If I jumped, she knew it was off. <laughs> Literally, she did that more than once, shame on me. She was one aggravating with a clever dog. She so anyway, laughing. yeah. She was laughing at you. She was. She would do it. And uh, But anyway, when you said grounded, that squirrel was grounded. Where the squirrel could climb along the, the, the power line up there, much higher voltage, much more current in it, we could just go across there, but it wasn't grounded. But that time, it was. Okay. So there is your ground. No potential difference. If it's, if it's not ground. Okay. So, let's look at power in circuits. Here is the formula for it. Power. Now, someone tell me what power is again. What are the normal units for power? 
A joule is a unit for work, work or energy. Newton. Okay, Newton is a unit for? I'm just guessing. Oh, okay. I can tell, okay. <laughs> Newton is a unit for force. What's your unit for power? What? 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 Yeah, what? what? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, and what is a what? A what? Okay. What? Yeah. What was the, when I said what is power? You, someone said I think, but I know I told you. Power is? Time. Rate of change of? Ah, Boy, it was work. a long time ago, wasn't it? Yeah, work or energy. Yeah. Energy and work is measured in what? what? No. I'm not falling for it. I'm not falling for it. No. You told me a few minutes ago energy or work is measured in joules, and the time rate of change would be joules per second, right? Yeah. That would be a watt. A watt is a joule per second. Okay? Watt measure power. Joules measures work, second measures time. Time rate of change of doing work, that's power. Okay? So you could say this is the units. You usually don't write it that way. That would be written as uh, power is equal to work or energy per unit time. Okay? One or the other. You don't have to use it. It's either work or energy per unit time. The units would be watts is equal to per second. So your power is measured in watts or joules per second. Okay? Now what did I say current was, or what did we say last time current was measured in? What is current? Amperage. Okay, and what is an amp? In reference to other units and quantities we've talked about so far? Oh, there it was. Current is? Second. Okay, chart, yeah. Good deal, thank you. Okay. All right. So it's charge per unit time, the time rate of change of charge. Okay? That's what current is. Is the movement of charge. Charge divided by time. Okay, so that would be, and what is charge measured in? Say again. Charge is measured in? Oh. No, that's potential difference. Charge is measured in? We'll get to it in a minute here. Ha. Huh. The name is up there. Coulomb. Coulombs, exactly. There, a unit of charge is the coulomb. Okay? So a an amp is a coulomb per second. Time rate of change of charge. Charge per unit time, coulombs per second, charge per time. That is current. Okay? I'll get up. Ah. Here's what volt is. What is volt? Potential difference. What is that? What is a volt? Yes. Time rate of change of work or energy. Okay, but not time rate of change. It's the units. Say again. What's Q? Charge. charge is the is is the energy per unit charge. Okay. Okay, or work per unit charge. Okay, that's what potential difference is. All right, I think we got them all now. Oops. Yeah, here we go. So, uh, power is measured in joules per second. Current is what? Remind me. We just went back to get it. Let me do this. Power is work per unit time. Current is? I just flipped back and you told me. 
What is it? Help me. Do I have to flip back again? Whoop. What's that? There it is. Current is charge per unit time. Okay? So this is Q per unit time. Charge per unit time. That would be measured. What is charge measured in? Coulombs per what's time measured in? Second. Okay. And then what's voltage? What's that? It's per unit charge. What per unit charge? Do I need to go back? Whoops, was that it? There it is. Work or energy per unit charge. Okay? All right. So voltage would be work per unit charge, right? And that work is measured in what unit? Work or energy is measured in what unit? Help me, folks. Okay. Okay, work or energy. Joules per... It's right there. Second. Second. Okay. Um, that's your work. Per unit charge, and what's your charge? Okay, no, that's not right. It's joules per coulomb, not joules per second. I agreed with you incorrectly. Okay, I was just trying to get you to joules per coulomb. Okay, joules per coulomb. Okay, now notice here the charges cancel out, and what do you have? Work per unit time. The uh, coulombs cancel out, joules per second. That's what power is. That's why we can multiply current by voltage and you get power. Okay? Now, the next thing they're going to bring up, we're going to come back to this a little bit later. Okay? So hang on to that concept. You need to remember that. Power is current times voltage. Okay? And guess what? There's two other formula uh, equations you can get out of that. Anyone want to ask? Guess what they are? A lot like Ohm's Law. V, equal to P over I. v is equal to P over I. And I equals P over V. P over V. You got it. Two more. Anytime you have that multiplication division relationship, you can come up with at least three formulas. Okay? All right, we're going to come back to that a little bit later, so hang on to that concept. All right, now let's talk about your electric bills. What do you pay for on your electric bills? Say again? The energy you use. Now, even though we call it the power bill, you're not buying power. You're buying energy. Okay? So the, what you're paying for is the energy you use, not the power. You don't use power. You, power is the time rate of change of energy. So you're buying the energy. So let's go back to this concept. That's a joule per second. So how could we get your, that to be joules? If, if P is equal to W over T, that's what we said right here. P is equal to W over T. How do you get work or energy? Multiply both sides of the equation by? If you're trying to isolate the work or the energy, multiply both sides of the equation by? T. Okay. Now, does anyone happen to pay close enough attention to your power bill? To know what units they say you've used that energy. Watch per second or what? Yeah. Sort of close, but not quite. Watt. And they don't use watt seconds, they use, in fact, they don't even use watts. 
They use kilowatt per hour. Per no, hour. Not kilowatt hours. The product, not the per. Per means division. That means multiplication. Kilowatt hours. Okay. Now they could use joules. Joules are the unit for uh, energy. Any idea why they don't use joules? No clue. Okay. A joule is a um, a watt is a joule per second, right? Okay. So a kilowatt would be a thousand joules per second. And then to get from seconds to hours, you would multiply by 60 and then 60, that would be 3,600. So you'd have 1,000 times 3,600. You would be one kilowatt hour would be 3.6 million joules. Do you think that your customers are going to say, oh, I use a million joules, i got to cut back, you know. No, that's way too big a number and small of a unit. They want to use a really big unit that gives you a fairly small number so people don't panic and say, oh, I'm using that much energy. So they use kilowatt, thousand watt hours, not seconds, but hours. So that covers a lot of energy. Okay, kilowatt hours. Okay. So let me erase some of this so you can read what's going to come next. So energy uh, and the electric bill, and this is sort of bizarre how they do this. Okay, watts is your power. Multiply power times time, that's your energy. Uh, this is the rate at which they do dollars per kilowatt hour. This is wrong. They say per kilowatt hour. Uh, per kilowatt, that's not what you're paying, is per kilowatt hour. You need that other unit there. And then they divide by a thousand to get from watts to kilowatt. Really a stupid way, I mean, a silly way to do it. If you give a watt, just move your decimal three places and make it kilowatts, and then you got, you can just do it there. Just move that, do that right at the beginning and get it in kilowatts. And then that's your cost. You pay for the energy, not the power. The power is in there, but you have to multiply it by time to get energy. Converts watts to, I'm sorry, okay. Power in kilowatt, I mean energy in kilowatt hours, kilowatt being power, hours being time. Whoa. That's it for the electric, electricity part, except for some Examples. So let's go back and do some examples. Okay, I think we'll do them here. <clears throat> here we have, on example 6.5, a 1,100 watt hair dryer. 1,100 watt hair dryer. What is that measuring? What are you measuring with watts? Power, that's your power measurement, okay? Uh, is designed to operate on 120 volts, which is standard electrical circuit. What's that a measure of? Under 20 volts measures. We've only asked this question three or four times today. But it's been at least 15 minutes, so. What does, under, what does volts measure? This is the easiest one. Current over time. Current over time. I don't know. <laughs> no, simpler than that. This measures your voltage. Right? Volts measures voltage. Ask the question if it's so simple. Huh? I kept telling you it was simple. And what potential, what voltage is, is your potential difference. That's the best answer, potential difference. But we often call it voltage. The symbol for it is V. Okay? This is just to get to the problem. How much current does the dryer require? What are we looking for? How much current? I, this is the unknown here. So what's the relationship between power, voltage, and, and current? 
Help me. What's the relationship between power, voltage, and current? Say again? No. The, the equation, the formula that relates those two. It was just on the board right where that is now before I took it off. I only took it off so we could have room to write the problem. I wrote it right over here a little bit ago. The basic formula was right in there, right about where 120 volts is there. Now, what's that again? Okay, that would be true in Ohm's law. We don't have volt, we don't have resistance in this one at all. We have power. That's it. I is equal to P divided by V. And what was your power in this case? Yeah, 1100 watts divided by 120 volts. Okay. This will give you something in current. So if someone's got a calculator, 110 divided by 12. Yeah, or 1100 divided by 120. I don't know. I'm just saying it'd be easier, a little bit easier not to have to punch in two more zeros, but you know, you can punch them in if you want to. 12 will go in 110, just over 9.1. 9. What? 1.6. Let's call it 9.2. 9.2 because we have basically two significant digits in both of these cases. And what would that be measured in? What's I measured in? Amps. amps, exactly. 9.2 amps. Boy, I feel like a dentist here pulling teeth. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think I got a grip on any of them. Okay. <laughs> All right. 9.2 amps. Now, guess what, folks? A couple of things to notice here. Anything that produces heat is going to have to have a lot of power. Okay? 1100 watts is a lot more than a light bulb, okay? You don't have any light bulbs at 1100 watts. The biggest of them is maybe 150, right? So this is 10 times that, more than 10 times that. And it also draws a lot of current. Remember the light bulb in the previous example was um, 0.5 amps. This is 20 times that, okay? Almost. Okay, so yeah, anything that that is uh, produces a lot of heat is going to take a lot of current and is going to require a lot of power. Okay. So, when someone is getting uh, going to the electric chair. Yeah. Which they don't use anymore, but yeah, let's so go back. Used to use yeah. It. Right. So they was applying. Were they going by the weight of the person? Are they just yeah. Okay, uh, that's a really good question. I never was there to find out for sure. The one in Alabama was called Big Yellow, wasn't it? Or Yellow Mama or something like that. But anyway, uh, why was electric chair work as an execution means? It's a really good concept, and I'm not really answering the question you're asking, but why would that, was that an effective means of like of uh, uh, oh, what's the word for it? Uh, killing somebody basically is what it is. Why would electric chair work? Sodium. Say again. Sodium. Okay, that's really not much to do with sodium or an element. It conducts through the water in the human body. Okay. Well, why would that bother us? Because uh, our body is mostly water. Okay, but also our living bodies are electrical machines. Okay, every heartbeat, think about how frequently, I mean, your heart beats about one time a minute, right? One time a second? 
Yeah, yeah one time a second. I'm sorry. Sixty times a minute. Yeah, one time a second, day and night, every year you've ever lived. Lived. What is telling the heart to beat? Nerve. A nerve which carries a current. A current. Elect you are an electrical thing. How can you see? <laughs> you know, you're receiving things. Um, okay. uh, the light comes in through your. Um, photoreceptors? Yeah, in the back of your. On the retina are photoreceptors. I'm trying to think why the, the lens and the things that. The aperture and stuff that goes through. They have names I can't think of now. But yeah, the back of the retina is a bunch of photoreceptors. And when, when the light energy hits that, it sends off an electrical pulse. And somehow your brain ties all that together and sees Chris's red shirt and your says orange shirt, you know, and your Toyota uniforms, you know, it sees all that and processes it. Okay? Amazing. It's all electrical. Okay? You are an electrical object. Okay? Now, your nerves run on milliamps. Very, very, very low current, very low uh, uh, voltage as well, okay? Because you're not a very good re resistor. You're a pretty good conductor. We just learned that we are. Huh? We just learned that in class that we are. Okay. You're very resistant to something. No, what, what did you learn? Body is a pretty good resistor. Oh, really? Where did you learn this in? Uh, P10. In what? Toyota class. You really? Yeah. Okay. They you do. On YouTube. We, we learned on YouTube. Okay. <laughs> you do have a resistance for sure. Okay. But it's, if you think, you're mostly salt water. Salt water's a pretty good conductor, right? Yeah. Okay. You do have resistance for sure, but it's not a huge amount. So, a little bit of current will go a long way because you don't have that much resistance. So, what the electric chair did was suddenly hit you with a huge potential difference, sending a lot of current through you, and you burned your circuits like that. I mean, you, when I was telling you, turn down the, the, the voltage you know, in the lab, I didn't want my bulbs to, to, to uh, fry. That's what, you know. Cranking that baby up like that was exactly what the uh, electric chair did. That's how it killed people. But did they soak them in water or something? Um, they made sure you were well grounded. I don't know exactly how they did it. I, I'm certain they had their shoes off. And I bet you it was a metal plate underneath it. The chair itself, I think, was wooden. And the the uh, electrodes were, I don't know where they collected them, to the head? They were, they were on the head. On the head, the, and then they went right through the body. I want to say it was the uh, water, salt water or soaked sponge between your scalp and the other. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. And but salt water is very similar to blood, okay? So I, it was a pretty good condition. I looked it up. The uh, Alabama water chair, water chair, electric chair was called Yellow Mama. Yellow Mama, okay. And, uh, and we were one of the last states to still use them. Now nobody uses them. Anymore. 2002 was the last time we ever actually somebody. 2002? Used them. I know. Uh, <laughs> now, out west, how did they used to? Uh, Fire squad. Okay, at one time. But they also hung. hung people way back. And did you know there was a law, I think it was maybe New Mexico, that you could not hang a man with a wooden leg? Really? Yeah, you had to use a rope. That's a joke. Okay. <laughs> All right. Never mind. Yeah. Okay. I had to tell him it was. A, never mind. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's move on to. Okay. Did that answer your question about that? I don't know for sure what it was, but that's what they did. They put a huge amount of voltage, which produced a lot of current, and basically it fried the electrical system. In your body, your face. What's that? After you went from the head down. Yeah, test. yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised. I never saw anything. I bet. I bet you, the people who had blisters on their feet where all that current went through them, and uh, it was pretty inhumane. That's why they quit doing it. But however, you kill people is fairly inhumane by definition, isn't it? I mean, you're killing somebody. That's not humane. 
Okay, example 6.6. .6. An electric fan is designed to draw 0.5 amps. What's 0.5 amps a measure of? What symbol is that? I. I, very good. Okay, the I's have it. In a 120 volt circuit, what's that a measure of? Voltage, or potential difference is really the better answer, but we usually use the symbol volts. What is the power rating of the fan? So we're looking for power. How does power relate to current and voltage? Come on, that's the easy one. Say again? What is the unit? But what's the formula that relates power, current, and voltage? Power, current, and voltage? Yeah. E equals IV. IV, you got it. Okay. So this will be 0 0.5 amps times 120 volts. Pretty easy math. What would that be? 0 0.5 times 120. Yep. Say again? No, two times 120 would be 240. 60. 60 watts. Watt. Very good. All right, you got it that time. Okay. All right, 60 watts. That's like a normal light bulb, okay? That's your electric fan. Doesn't require a lot of power. It's not producing a lot of heat. Doesn't require much amperage. Only half an amp. Whereas the hair dryer wasn't that, uh, yeah, that was nine point two amps, so quite a bit more. Okay. In your text on page one fifty four is a table there that relates a lot of these units uh, or quantities. Charge Q is equal to n times e a coulomb. Charge equivalent to uh, that huge number 6.24 times 10 to the 18 particles such an electron that's your charge but charge is measured in coulomb electric potential is the uh, voltage and that's energy per unit charge W per Q energy or work per unit charge joules per coulomb that's what a volt is current is charge per unit time the time rate of change of charge that is your flow of charge. That would be coulombs per second. One amp is a coulomb per second. Electrical resistance, R, ohm, is voltage per unit amp, or unit current, so that's volts per amp. That's an ohm. And electrical power is uh, current times voltage, so it's, um, they didn't put those exactly there. Current is coulombs per second. Voltage is Joules per uh, coulomb, coulombs cancel out, that gives you joules per second, which is a measure of power, Why? Okay, there is a pretty interesting little blurb here on shocking costs. Um, really not all that shocking, but I guess they're trying to be funny with it. Um, hair dryers, way more usage than say something like a tel... Well, actually, the television is pretty high, too. Blow dryer is pretty high. Um, electric dryer, really high. Um, coffee maker, you think that'd be higher or not? Uh, yeah, pretty high. Yeah, because you're a heat. Toaster? Yes. Yeah, can openers? No. No, really low on that. Vegetable steamer? Yes. Yeah. A microwave oven? Yes. Actually, less than you would think. Oh, yeah, because it's using. Yeah, heat. it's not producing heat, it's producing vibrations of the molecules that produces the heat, and that's a fairly low energy thing. So, microwave ovens way more energy efficient than putting it in an oven or stovetop or something like that. Correct me if I'm wrong, but in the World War II era, didn't we use microwaves as a form of radio signals? We still do. We still do. Yeah. You see all. Uh, well, signal these towers, yeah. you know, for cell phones. I think those are largely microwaves. Really? Yeah, aren't they? I, I'm pretty sure they are. So, what causes the microwaves 
that are shot from cell phone tower to cell phone tower to not kill birds that fly between them, but can trip potatoes. Okay. Uh, because it, it basically has to do with frequencies and, and concentration okay. uh, of it. And uh, the microwave oven, they, they tune it for a frequency. I, I think there's two things that respond to it well. It's water and oils, I believe. And they must have some fairly close to that. And they just really get the water molecules excited, and that friction is what cooks it. And that's why they say the microwave ovens cook from the inside out. Yep. Okay. And uh, I think oils do that too. But if you try to do something like heat rice in it, which doesn't have much water, starches don't do well with that. So and breads don't do particularly well, but they'll have some moisture in it. So that's why some things cook better in microwave ovens. Yeah. Great question. Okay. Uh, microwave oven blender, high or low? Low. Yeah, pretty low. Okay. Um, your desk lamp? Pretty hot. Well, if, it depends on what kind of bulb it has. Yeah. If it's getting pretty hot, it's relatively high, but yeah. A desk lamp doesn't need a lot high wattage bulb because it's right there above you, so usually they're pretty low wattage, so usually not too bad. And especially if you had a LED or a compact fluorescent in it, really low. Um, and they have, what three have the greatest monthly electrical costs. That's uh, so the electric devices in your household. I don't know what you have in yours. So probably going to be the clothes dryer, the oven, and water heater. Water heater, yeah. You would be here all the time. And remember back on the energy chapter? I hope everybody's taking that test already. If we did a smart job of heating water with solar power, and you can run pipes over, you know, thing. That saves you a huge amount of energy because that's free. It's just up there. Okay. All right. Benjamin Franklin is the person behind the science. Why have we got a postmaster, the first postmaster general of the U.S., uh, in a physics book or a physical science book? Because he got shocked by lightning. Okay. He was not only a, uh, a statesman. He was one of the five that wrote the Declaration of Independence. Brilliant guy, statesman, everything else. He's also a really high caliber scientist. He was an inventor. Have y'all ever heard of the Franklin stove? Yeah, yeah the, the, the pot belly stove. stove. Yeah, sort of like a wood stove. He, he came up with the idea. Really? Before that, fireplaces. Most of the heat goes right out of the top. Okay? He did the Franklin stove so the heat radiates from all over and just a little bit of it goes out with the smoke. But even that is a metal pipe that it's produces crazy. heat into the room. So, yeah, pretty brilliant scientists. So this cannot be your your source. You'll have to go elsewhere, but Benjamin Franklin would be a pretty good source here. You can, uh, I mean, pretty good paper topic. Um, and it's an interesting read anyway. I was just seeing, I, I it doesn't mention it here, but I'm almost certain that at one time or another he was on the delegation of our, he may have been the ambassador to France or he may have been on the delegation that was. And I'm, just by the timing of things, I bet you he interacted with Coulomb and, and uh, Ampere and those other guys because he was all over electricity. And like I say, I'm almost certain that he's the one that decided to, uh, uh, name the electrons negative and the protons positive. I'm, I don't think that mentions it here, but he's a pretty incredible character. Okay, let's do example 6-7 now. Uh, I'll erase what we've got here. All right. What is the cost of operating a 100-watt light bulb? What's that a measure of? Power, very good. Uh, for one hour, what's that a measure of? That's your time. Okay. If the utility rate is, yeah, dream on, folks, 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Okay. 
that is your rate. Now, you don't have to use the formula they have in the book. It makes sense just to... I like the concept of dimensional analysis. Let your units guide you through the problem. Okay? Now, do you notice any uh, problems with the units here? Power is measured in watts, but the rate is in kilowatt hours. So one thing we need to do is either convert this watts to kilowatts, or convert this to watt hours rather than kilowatt hours. Easy to do that. How many kilowatts is 100 watts? Anyone know? Sega. Point 0.1, you got it. So just change this to 0 0.1. You can put the two extra zeros if you want to, kilowatts. Exactly. You go from a smaller unit to a bigger unit, so you go from a big number to a smaller number. So move it three places, 0 0.1 kilowatts. Okay? Now, this is for kilowatt hour, so you got to multiply your kilowatts by hours. That gives you kilowatt hours, right? So 0.1 kilowatts times one hour is how many kilowatt hours? Really easy. So one times point one. One times point one. What happens if you multiply something by 1? Yeah, it doesn't change. So that is 0 0.100 0, 0 kilowatt hour. Okay, you multiply kilowatts by hour, you get kilowatt hours. Multiply 0 0.1 by 1, you get 0 0.1. It doesn't change. And then, that's how many kilowatt hours. Multiply that by your rate. So multiply this. 0 0.10 kilowatt hour. Here the kilowatt hours cancel per kilowatt hour. And what's 0 0.1 times 0 0.1? Anyone do it? 1 .1 times 1 .1. No, 0 0.1 times 0 0.1. 0 0.01. It costs you one penny to run that, what was it? 100 watt light bulb for an hour. One penny. Now that's back when it was 10 cents a kilowatt hour. I'm guessing now we're probably up closer to 20, maybe 17, 18, 19, 20. I don't know. I haven't looked at my energy bill lately. My wife usually pays that online, so I never see the bill. Uh, but. I bet you the rate is way more than 10 cents, okay, per kilowatt hour. Uh, okay, but that would have cost a penny back in the day, okay? Now, one cent. Let's do example 6.8. An electric fan draws 0 0.5 amps. What's that a measure of? Point 0.5 amps, what's that measuring? Current. current. What's the symbol for current? I. I, very good. Okay. In a 120 volt circuit, what's that a measure of? Volts or potential difference is the better answer. What is the cost of operating the fan if the rate is 10 cents per kilowatt hour? So again, the same rate as above. Okay, that's down here too. Okay. Um, okay, this time they didn't give you the, okay, what were you saying? You may have said it right, I just wasn't listening. 0. 0.5 times 120? Exactly. Power is equal to current times potential difference. That would be 0. 0.5 amps times... Uh, 120 volts and that would be 60 watts of power. Okay? Now, 
multiply that by again no oh okay what is the cost of operating the fan if the rate is so this cost is not going to be in dollars and cents it's going to be cost per hour okay and what you do since you don't know how many hours uh, this cost is per kilowatt hour well the first thing you got to do is get that watts to kilowatts how many kilowatts is 60 watts uh, point six. nope point zero six. Point zero 0.06 kilowatts okay so multiply that by your your rate and you have 0 0.010 that's dollars per kilowatt hour multiply it by 0 0.06 kilowatts notice the kilowatts go out and this gives you per hour when you multiply that that gives you 0 .00 0 .00 oh, I, yeah yeah uh, wait a minute I got something wrong here, I think. Oh, yeah, that's where I got it wrong. It's 10 cents, not point oh, not 1 cent. Okay, sorry. This is 10 cents. Point 0.1, yeah. I knew something was badly wrong there. I was looking at my answer from before. Okay, so this gives you... 0 0.006 so that's a tenth six tenths of a penny per hour okay. huh? second a, a, a hay penny close to it anyway that's per hour so you can run for for two hours it costs you 1.2 cents okay so that's how many cents per hour all right and Ashland's here. Okay? Good deal. All right. So let's leave electrical power and work and move to magnetism. This is 6.3. So we're making good progress in the chapter. I don't think we'll come close to finishing the chapter, but at least we've made good progress. I believe we'll, we'll finish it on Tuesday. Though. Now, the earliest ideas of magnetism are uh, associated with naturally occurring magnetic materials. Uh, anyone ever heard of lodestone? Yes. Okay. That was naturally occurring magnetic rock. It's, the mineral for that is called, you remember this from the last course magnetite it's exactly the same chemical composition as hematite which is just iron ore except the magnetite actually has there it is right there has magnetic characteristics whereas normal hematite does not the common name for it was lodestone and people found out it was attracted it was magnetic material naturally occurring magnetic material Okay, so what they started doing, once they found some of it, they found out if they took other magnetic materials that wasn't magnetized, rub them on the lodestone or the magnetite, and they could make them into magnets. And that was uh, generally what was done. Now, what was one of the earliest uses for magnet, mag, magnets? Not magnets, but magnets. Finding water. Say again? Finding water. No. Okay, you must be one of those guys. Okay, yeah. <laughs> this is, this is on your fridge. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was it. Oh, why did I think of that? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, exactly. Navigation. Okay. Compass. Okay. Um, Chris, did you ever do any orienteering? Huh? Oh, yeah. Uh, orienteering is a sport that someone goes out and maps out a, uh, a course for you, generally in the wilderness, but it could be in a city. Did you ever do any in a town? Uh, map out the thing, and you're given 
a contour map and a compass, and that's it, isn't it? And you take off. Really? How would you know even where to go then? They gave you grid coordinates. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, you still need a map to read the grid coordinates, would you? Well, I mean, they. Okay. But anyway, you would need it for that. Navigation on the sea. Were you ever on a ship? Oh, you weren't? Poor thing. Okay. Poor uh, thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Out there, there are just not many landmarks, okay? <laughs> Middle of the ocean. The horizon's always the same, okay? Everywhere you look, it's the same. So that was where those magnets were, in my mind, first used reasonably. Now, one thing we notice about it, when you magnetize it, the needle is always a needle, right? One points north and one point south, approximately, okay? And these are called the poles, characterized by poles. Now, we usually say a north pole and a south pole. The better definition or wording would be a north-seeking pole and a south-seeking pole. We never say that. But that's really what we are meaning when we say a North Pole and a South Pole. Okay? Uh, now, <clears throat> of all the elements on the periodic table, does anyone know how many of these are naturally occurring magnetic materials? Uh, I know iron is one. Iron is one. You're absolutely right. I want to say there's very few. Very few. Every three. Iron, nickel, nickel, and cobalt. Okay. Iron is probably the most frequently occurring metal, not really on the planet, but in the planet, because most of our core is iron. Okay, the, the, the core of the earth. Second in the core would be nickel, that is very little cobalt. Okay, it's a fairly rare uh, metal. So the other magnetic materials are iron, cobalt, and nickel. Cobalt and is a heavy metal, correct? No, they're all right there together. Okay. On the periodic table, they just bang, bang, bang. 50, no, 26, 27, and 28. Iron is 26, cobalt 27, nickel is 28. Right in a row there, just in the middle of the transition elements. The things below them are not magnetic, nothing's really above them. They are happen to be the three naturally occurring, and they're often called ferromagnetic materials. Ferro meaning iron. Okay? What is the symbol for iron? Anyone know? Chemical symbol? E no. Fe. Fe. Ferro. That means iron. Uh, Cobalt and nickel are also that, but they're naturally occurring magnetic material, ferromagnetic material. And basically, I think that comes from the same root word as fire, and they used to, you know, have to heat up iron to purify it. So that's, I think that's how it got its name. Okay, the modern view is associated with magnetic fields, okay? Before, we only associated with those naturally occurring magnetic materials, those on the magnetite, or, you know, the same name. Now we know it's associated with magnetic field. Because there's other ways to produce magnets than those three materials. The field lines, just like we did for, uh, okay, let's go back to electrical field. That's really what's doing the work with electricity too. What is the convention for electric field lines? Where do they, they originate and where do they go to? North and south. No, you're talking magnetic. Oh. Electrical. Uh, it was yeah. two days ago. That was a long time. So. Okay, they're in battery too, but think charges. Positive and negative. Okay, where do they originate? Where do they end? Field lines. The field lines always go from the positive towards the negative. Okay. Because remember, the convention is if you had a small positive charge, where would it go? goes away from a positive charge and toward a negative charge because like poles repel, I mean like charges repel, unlike charges attract. So 
the for electrical field lines, you always go from positive to negative, which basically we say that's what's happening in a battery too. Conventional current, you know, we get that. Okay? Now, with uh, magnetic fields, we say the lines always go from north to south. In other words, if you put a little compass in that field line, that's the way it's going to go. The, the north pole of the compass is going to pull away from the north pole of the magnet and toward the south pole of the magnet. So it's pointing from north to south. So the field lines always go from north to south poles. Okay. Now, in electric fields, you can quite easily have an isolated positive charge, right? Or you could have an isolated negative charge, right? In magnets, can you ever have an isolated north pole? Never. Or an isolated south pole? Never. Never. Well, wait a minute. Okay, here's a bar magnet. Okay, if I put it down under a piece of uh, piece of paper over it, sprinkle iron filing, iron filings on it, all those iron filings are going to aggregate right around the north pole and the south pole. Yeah. Very few in the middle, right? Correct. So what I do is break it in half. Okay. Okay. So now I isolated the north, I isolated the south. Now you've got two magnets. No, you've got two magnets. So where you broke it, suddenly that becomes your south pole here. That becomes Why your is north that? Say again. Why is that? Because, Why does that happen? because uh, magnetic fields and poles, well, okay, the fields and poles are inseparable, but poles always come in north-south pairs. Okay. They are always, magnets are always dipole. Okay. You can never have a monopole, you know, a single pole. But you can with an electromagnet, correct? No. No. Is that, yeah. Any, any magnet is always going to be north-south. Now, those that you put on your fridge, one side is positive, one is north, and one south. They may be very close to each other, but they are one yeah. south. Because if you take that little thin magnet and take two of them, try to turn them this way, yeah, they're going to do that, or they do that, you know. So they never show up as monopoles. Okay. Ever. They're always dipoles. Okay, and the fields and the poles are inseparable. They're part of each other. The poles always come in north side pair. Never a monopole, where you can't have a monocharge, but you can't have a monopole. Field lines go from north pole to south pole, we already said that. And light, just like charges, light magnetic poles repel each other, unlike poles attract each other. Okay? So here's that example I was just saying. If you had a bar magnet, and if you put iron filings on it, all the iron filings are going to aggregate there. Almost nothing in the middle, almost no magnetic characteristics in the middle, break it in two, <laughs> no longer. So you've got here, 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 and here, okay? Suddenly that is going to south pole, that becomes the north pole. Break it again, and it just keeps happening and keeps happening and keeps happening. You would have to break it down to the atomic level before you quit having that, okay? In fact, that's why iron, nickel, and cobalt are the only magnetic materials. We'll get to that a little bit later. Okay, there is a picture illustrating that on page two, 156 of your text. They dropped iron filings on a bar magnet, and boy, that was a strong bar magnet. I mean, they're like chia things, you know, the, uh, right around the poles. Of the the uh, filings are just all there, nothing in the middle. Okay. Let's we'll see. Yeah. All right. If you were drawing the uh, field lines, and they're only sort of a construct, they're, they're not really lines there, but the, the field is there, and we represent them with lines, and they're not just in the board, they'd be coming out this way and back into the board too, okay? But they always originate at the north and point to the south. How do we do that? Just like an electric field, you imagine a little isolated positive test charge, which way would it go? <clears throat> this time you imagine a little magnetic compass, which way would it point? It points away from the north and toward the south. So that's how you determine the field line. Okay.
I don't know what was supposed to be there, <coughs> but we'll move on. Now, what are the sources for these magnetic fields? Okay? You have these microscopic fields. I would even venture to say sub-microscopic fields. Okay? Um, of your subatomic particles, your electrons, your protons, and your other things going on there. Uh, and it comes from the spins on those. Now, I'm going to say something now that we're going to hit later on. Magnetic fields occur when you have moving charges. Remember that. Magnetic fields occur when you have moving charges. And guess what you have moving around? Every nucleus of every atom electrons and their charges, right? Going around, spinning around their crazy. Why isn't everything magnetic then? Because for every electron you have doing this, you have another one doing that, and this and that. You know, they, just, they all cancel each other out, so none of them are magnetized except iron, nickel, and cobalt. Those are the only ones. So first is the spinning of the subatomic particles, Electrons, protons, and stuff. The protons are stuck in the nucleus. They're not going to contribute a lot. But more is the or or orbital motion of the electrons in the atoms. And certainly every atom has bunches of electrons. It's not like you only have one. But it's still not uh, magnetic because uh, they <coughs> can't cancel each other out. So on your macroscopic level, you have several types of magnets. One is permanent magnets, that would be lodestone, or anything you made a magnet by rubbing it on lodestone. The earth is a magnet, okay, and we talked about this in the other course as well, and part of the reason for that is the earth is, now this is more detail than you probably need, got a crust, right? And inside the crust is the mantle, which is also pretty much solid, but inside the mantle is the core. And the outer core is liquid, and that's mostly iron and nickel, okay, some other things too. And the earth is always spinning. Now that's not a smooth thing inside and smooth mantle outside. It's pretty rough. So when it's spinning, the electrons are getting knocked off of one thing onto another, so you have moving charges in that iron core, okay? And that moving charge make a magnetic field. That's why the Earth has magnetic fields. And, as we just said, moving charges produce uh, magnetic fields. What is a moving charge? An electric current. Now, is this wire producing much of a magnetic field? Moving charges are in there. What kind of charges are moving in that? Two types of current. Huh? Two types of current. Okay, uh, two types of electrical current. Okay. Those are two types of charges. Two types of current. Your cars have one. AC DC. Okay. This is this is alternating current. So a moving charge, the charges are doing that. So whereas the field would be like this and then like this and like this. It cancels each other out. They're swapping so frequently you'll never measure that. So basically your electrical current will only be DC electrical current to produce some type of magnetic field. And that leads to electromagnets. Okay? Now we're going to do a little bit more with both of these later. Uh, in fact, pretty soon. Uh, what is the device in a lot of electronics, including your cars, that produce these magnetic fields. There's a special name for them. They're using switches, uh, all sorts of devices like that. As soon as I say it, I know you'll recognize it. Solenoids. Don't you use solenoids? All over in your electronics, right? Those are little magnetic field producers. 
basically a solenoid is a coil of wire with current running through it, DC current running through it, and that produces a magnetic field. Now the only difference in that and the mag electromagnet, put an iron core in the solenoid, now you have electric electromagnet. That basically, that's really oversimplified, but it's basically what's going on there. Okay? So let's look at our permanent magnet. Okay? Given a random piece of iron, it's not going to be magnetized. Even though iron, nickel, and cobalt were the only three naturally occurring magnets, any random piece of iron is generally not going to be magnetic. Okay? And the reason is, for iron, nickel, and cobalt, the ferromagnetic materials, they're the only ones that do this, they have every atom of them, every atom of them, is a little magnet. But you see where one atom might be like this, the other like this, the other like this, so they cancel each other out, generally. Now they, they're showing these as packets, they're calling them. Um, the ato atomic magnetic moment, the electron, proton, intrinsic moments that you have, the electron orbital motion, those all produce little magnetic characteristics. The clusters of the atomic moment align in what they call domains. So every one of these is a domain. But notice on a normal piece of iron, one domain will be pointed this way, one that way, one that way, one this way, and every way in between. You know, So they generally cancel each other out, they're demagnetized. Even though every domain is magnetized, but they're put in different directions. Now you put that piece of iron in a strong magnetic field. And guess what it does? Those domains tend to line up with the field. Not all of them. Some of them will still be pointing downward. Some will be actually backward. But most of them will point in that direction of the magnetic field. And when they do, that becomes a magnet. Okay? When the domains align, that becomes a magnet. Have you ever been down in Mobile or some other big port city and seen them load the big cargo ships? Okay. In the old, old, old days, that was done by taking straps and putting around the things and, and trying to get them balanced well and picking them up and hoping nothing shifts and stuff and they fall out. Nowadays, they don't do that. Yes, it's just like in a junkyard. Have you been in a junkyard? And they, because cars and things like that are metal, the... The... Connexes. The... Second? The connexes, the metal boxes. What do you call it? Connex. Connex? What is that? The metal box that goes... Oh, yeah, right. Okay, right. Okay. I see what you mean. For transporting on... Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, the the tractor-trailer trucks have them, yeah. and as soon as they get there to the thing, take off the tractor, pick it up, put it on board. You don't have to unload, load, and stuff like that. You move the whole container. That's what it's called, the connex? Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. I didn't move the term. Thanks. Okay. What you're doing there, you have an electromagnet like this. Well, not quite like this. Electromagnet, you put the current through it, it becomes magnetized, and very strong magnetic field. Your electromagnets can be 10 to 15 times stronger than your strongest permanent magnet. These are talking about permanent magnets. Your electromagnets can be much stronger than that. Just put more current through them, they can become very, very strong. Pick up that whole container, put it on the ship, turn off the juice, it's no longer a magnet. It goes back to random built orientation. Take it back down, put it over another one, turn on the juice, pick it up, put it, turn off the juice, shuts it down. That's how they work, okay? The domain alternate from being oriented to not oriented. Random orientation, uh, non-random, okay? When they're magnetized, the domains are aligned. When they're not magnetized, the domains are random, okay? And that's these little packets of atoms and stuff. That's the what they call the domains, okay? Now, we mentioned the Earth's magnetic field originates deep beneath the surface of the Earth 
from currents in the molten core. Molten means melted, so this is a melted core, just about all iron with some nickel in it. Both of those are magnetic materials, and the Earth is spinning around that core, knocking off electrons, so you have moving charges in, uh, uh, moving in basically in one direction, and you create a pretty, I mean, not super strong, but a magnetic field. The magnetic North Pole is really, if you think about this, if you don't call, if you call that compass and the needle is pointing north, if that's north, that means the Earth is the South Pole because north attracts south. So if you could call that the North Pole of the Earth, you would call this a North Seton Pole, which really is the South Pole. So it, you just have to make a decision with where you're going to call it. Most of the time, they'll say that. So this is saying the North Pole, magnetic North Pole of the Earth, would be the South Pole of the Earth's magnetic field because all our magnets point toward the North, and that would be the South Pole of God. Now, here's a deal for my good old globe. Y'all remember from the last time. <laughs> I can give you one of that. Okay. Where is the north? What's that? Oh, of course. Okay. Where, where is the north magnetic pole? Is that it? Not quite. The north magnetic pole is Canada. No, it's not. Yeah, it's in northern, very northern Canada. There it is, right there. It's offset a little bit from true north. How about that? Eh? Not, not exact. Okay. And the south magnetic pole is not in the center of Antarctica. It's actually further off near Australia. Got to get over here. Uh, it's in the middle of the compass. Yeah, correct. I can't see it. Never failed to find it on here, but now I just cannot see it. There it is. Okay. I knew it was there. Okay. There it is. Pretty much under South Australia. Actually, just outside the Arctic, Antarctic Circle. Whereas the North Magnetic Pole is well within the Arctic Circle. So it's a bit closer. This one's a bit further off. Okay. So they're not precise. And because of that, your magnetic north, most of the time, is not true north. The difference there, the offset, is called your magnetic declination. Okay? Let's see if we can get a slide to show that. Okay? Now, here's the one here. If indeed a compass is pointing toward the north, toward the north, and that's what we call the north pole of the compass, then that must be the south pole of the Earth's magnetic field, because that's where north uh, north poles north poles are pointing toward the south. Okay, so either this is backwards, or what we call it on the compass is backwards. And I guess we just decided to go on the Earth is backwards. Okay, that was that illustration. Here is the declination. Now it happens to be fairly close to where we are, in fact, zero declination goes right through the sort of east coast of Florida, almost to the center, almost cutting Georgia in half, that would be Atlanta, right about on zero, okay, right at Chattanooga is right on zero, um, let's see, what else? I would guess uh, Lexington is pretty close to that. Uh, you know, and you go up. That zero declination. Straight through the Trustful area. The what? The Trustful area? You're talking here? Yeah. Okay. That's five degrees. That's okay. half a degree. I can't read that on here. You read it in the book. No, that's two degrees east. Oh, okay. So it's two degrees off. Okay? But right through, almost through Atlanta, Chattanooga. Lexington, you know, you're right on zero declination, okay? And on this side, 
uh, your conference is on point. It's a little east of where two north is, mm -hmm. and on that side, a little west. So we're in an area where it's not far off, not far off at all. Uh, the year that I was, after they ended, uh, we got uh, our whole team at Southern Research Institute got laid off, laid off because EPA was no longer able to fund radon research and the changes to Congress, and they decided not to allow any extramural funding. So I was without work for about a year. I was doing anything I could. I was tutoring. I was working part time at Shelf State. And I got an opportunity to do some soil sampling, because that was my background, uh, over near Anniston. Uh, there was a really bad uh, corporate corporation, Monsanto, who dumped a whole bunch of really bad stuff into the uh, uh, environment. And a lot of folks who lived by that, near that, once they had lived there, pretty much their whole lives were developing all kinds of cancers, way more than they should have been. And uh, so there was a lawsuit going on. I never knew which side of the lawsuit I was on, but they hired uh, a contractor to get someone to do sampling, so I did that. And I had to just walk through the, the woods over outside of Anniston, taking samples every hundred maybe half mile or something like that, but I had to follow uh, a thing. But, you know, Anderson's right over here, so I wasn't far off from going north. When they were saying north, I wasn't far off from going north. It was maybe a couple degrees. So I just was trying to do a trip. And that's why I said. You don't think that's the majority of the money. You don't think that's the majority of that money. Who always gets it? The lawyers, right? Yeah. Uh, our system is not really a justice system, it's a legal system. The legal people get the rewards. Justice is very, fairly seldom met. Okay, sorry about that. That's just Okay, so the direction of the field period, uh, and here's the thing that is so totally bizarre, and I cannot even imagine, well, I can imagine a little bit, the Earth's magnetic field, the Earth's magnetic field has reversed itself, I think they said about 22 times as far as we can determine in history. So like the South Pole became the North Pole and the North Pole became the South Pole. Exactly. They happen about, the last time it happened was about 780,000 years ago. We weren't even around then. I mean, this, this was so long ago. What they measure this by is by taking cores through the down to the Earth's surface and measuring the glowstone deposits. And sure enough, some of them point this way, and then they'll be pointing that way, and then this way, and then that actually they'll point this way and then that way. And you keep going down. They have discovered 22 reversals. Now, in my mind, I cannot see how the Earth's magnetic field has changed like that except for this. If the spinning and the other things have a little offset over time if they're doing like this, then that would mean there are periods in between there, and indeed this seems to be true, when there is no magnetic field. When it's lined up like this, and then there's times when the field is stronger, times when it's weaker, times when it's zero. So I can almost imagine harmonic motion type thing. You know, sometimes it's this way, weak, stronger but in the opposite direction, very strong in the opposite direction, and then it just keeps going. That's the only model I can so, think so of. So what you're saying chance. is the reason it's flipped 22 times is because if we're normally rotating like this, you're right. thinking we, the, the Earth is flipped? The, 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 no, the, the charges inside oh, the Earth are going through, for some reason they're they're doing like this, and then they like this, and that would effectively do it. I don't know if that's true. That's the only construct I can think of. But it happens, you know, no more than every 1.4 million years, 1.5 million years. I'm not going to worry about it, okay? <laughs> but, you know, it's okay for now, and as long as we've been in existence, 
flow storm is pointed that way. <laughs> okay. But there probably was some time when there was no compass. Fortunately, when we were trying to do our exploration, there was good magnetic field so we could do that. Nowadays, of course, we have satellite navigation. We have gyroscopes, gyro compasses. They don't depend on magnetic at all. Okay. How are we doing? Okay. So, this is what I've been hinting at for a while now. Um, our book and the slides aren't quite matching up here, but uh, we've just done, they're a little out of order, but we're back on track pretty much. Now we're just doing electric currents and magnetism. This is 6.4 on page 159 for those who are following. And this is something I've been saying all along. Moving charges produce magnetic fields. Moving charges produce magnetic fields. Okay? If you have a wire going through a board, uh, a sheet of paper, say, and you sprinkle, or I would say sprinkle iron filings on it, that's one way to do it, or just put a little magnet there, a compass there. Send a fairly strong current. What kind of current? Strong. Okay. <laughs> the strong kind. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Two types of currents. Electric. Say again? Electric. Okay. Uh, uh, two types of electric current. That's the same thing <laughs> y'all answered the last water time. Water current. <laughs> okay. Then, uh, AC or DC. AC or DC. So what do we have here? Which would this be? DC. It wouldn't work for AC. But if you have a direct current going through the wire, the electrons going that way, the positive field going that way, then uh, you use what they call the right hand rule, but you use it for the positive charges, the positive charges are moving. Point your thumb on your uh, right hand in the direction of the current, the positive, the conventional current, and then your fingers will wrap around in the direction of the magnetic field. So if you put the little compass on there, have the current, the electron current moving that way, the conventional current moving that way, then this is going to point to the North Pole. The closer you are, the stronger it is, further out, you'll get less uh, likelihood. But if you move it around the thing, you'll see that it turns. It's not pointing north anymore, it's following the closer magnetic field, stronger one. Not the earth magnetic field. Maybe this would be a good time for this illustration. Uh, remember early on I told you about the project in the backyard, digging out the patio, that kind of stuff? Did they finish it? Huh? Did they ever finish it? Oh yeah, it's finished. I know. I'd have loved my wife would have left me do it. No, okay. <laughs> um, she may say no, no, no. Um, before I started on that project, I had to move the fence. Our, uh, uh, when we bought the house, there was a little shed behind the garage, and the little shed, you was, there was a privacy fence from the garage back to the corner, and when we had the lot surveyed when we were buying the house, we found out the property line was about four feet on the other side in the neighbor's yard. And so I asked a neighbor, and she was renting, so she asked her landlady, said, yeah, yeah, they knew that. They, but that's where the previous, some previous owners put the privacy fence. They wanted to take advantage of the garage rather than do it. And they built a shed, and one of the walls of the shed was the, the, uh, the privacy fence. And it was just a ramshackle old shed. It leaked. It was uneven on the, the ground. It was earth floor, you know. And it was rotting. You know, the termites had gotten into things. It was a hazard. So we decided we needed to take that down. So since we were going to take that down, it's probably going to bring the whole privacy fence issue down. And if we're going to put up a new one, we need to move it over to where the actual property line was. The landlady and the neighbors were all in, all fine. Yeah, that's your property, that's the property line, let's put it there. So that was the first project I did. And I was going to use eight foot sections of the, you know, stuff that. You use the privacy fence, you know, 
the point, you know, it came in eight foot sections. So I was going to put a, a, a post every eight feet. And uh, our house is on a lot. The house faces south, so the backyard where I was working was facing almost to north. And I put up the corner post, the one up at the top of the hill down here, the one near the garage back here. Um, and I planted those two, and then I was going to stretch a, a line so I could plant the others and have a straight fence. Okay, so I put a nail up here, and I was putting a nail in this one, facing almost true north, and I was hammering the nail into that post. I, want, I had to get it high because there's a hill there. I want it high here, and it's going to be low on that one up there, but I didn't have one string there. So I was hammering like this, and I'm not a very good hammer, by the way. Uh, I'm left-handed. My father always said that it was a right-handed hammer, but he got nothing. Okay, <laughs> but anyway, I was going along and just thought I had it in. I was about to let go of this, and poof, it fell out. So leaves and grass down here. I was looking for it. I just happened to hold the hammer down here, and suddenly the nail tried to attach itself to the hammer. Why? The hammer had been magnetized. Why? Because I was aligning myself oh. almost due north with the earth magnetic field. The nail was pointing that way, hammering that way. I was aligning I was doing everything along the Earth's magnetic field line. And sure enough, I had made the banging on the nail, I had made it into a magnet, little magnet. Okay? And it attached itself to the iron in the hammerhead. Um, a lot like your magnetic screwdrivers, you know, that when you drop the screw, you can fish around down there and get it out. Those are really nice things to have because I always drop screws too. But I was able to find that. Because of that. So, what had done that? Well, anytime you perturb or shake up a those domains, remember those domains before, and and shake them up, and then stop the hammering, they get fixed in that position. They don't go back to the random orientation again. So that's what I had indeed done was created the nail into a magnet because I was banging on it in the direction, just happened to be almost due north in the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, that had nothing to do with that slide, but I just happened to think of it. All right, now, the shape of the field is determined by the geometry of the current. That straight wire we just showed, that makes a circular field around the wire. As long as what kind of current's going through the wire? DC, direct current. Now, what you can do to make that a stronger magnetic field is rather than having a straight wire, take that wire and make a coil out of it. Okay? Now, right hand rule again. If you do that, then notice here my fingers all the way around are going to be pointing in the same. There's north that way. And the more you do, the more coils you have the stronger and stronger that North Pole is. What you just made is a solenoid. A coil, usually a fairly tightly wound coil with the current flowing through it. What kind of current? DC, direct current, that makes a solenoid. Okay? A single loop, notice here's your little thing. Now they have the electron flow this way, so your conventional current is that way. So put your fingers that way, and sure enough, they're around. So the North Pole would be up, because these are always pointing that way. North Pole would be up, South Pole would be down. One loop. Do more loops, and stronger, and stronger, and stronger magnetic field. So a single loop, or a bunch of loops, would then create a solenoid. Okay. And that's the global view of what we just had here with the electron current coming this way, conventional current that way. No, they have this one backwards. Okay, they reverse them on this one. Uh, because obviously this is going up like this now through the center. So, so it must be like this. The conventional current is that way. 
not your left hand. So north is up, south is down. Stronger than a straight wire, okay? More loops, stronger yet. And there's your solenoid, okay? A coil with a DC current, okay? Now the electron current this way, the conventional current that way, right hand rule, one this way, and you see it's going so all the way around that is pointing so the north is that way, south pole that way. There you created a pretty strong magnet. If you have enough coils there and enough current going from that battery, you've got a magnet way stronger than any permanent magnet probably you'll ever find. Solenoid. Now to make it into an electromagnet, stick an iron core in the middle of that, that's even stronger. Okay? And the good news there is that's a strong electromagnet as long as the current flow, turn off the current, it goes back to random orientation, so it's no longer a magnet. So that's what we're talking about next, electromagnet. So your structure of this is in the middle of that solenoid, that coil, Lots of coils there of uh, that thing of wire. You have a ferromagnetic core. Most of the time, we do have an iron. Now, let's go back to your table here. Notice it was iron, cobalt, and nickel. Iron is what they call, and it's not. This isn't how hard the iron is. It's how strong the magnets are. We call iron soft magnets and nickel hard magnets. The soft magnets are hard to magnetize, but they, they keep the magnetism longer. The hard magnets, wait, the hard magnets are hard to magnetize to keep it longer. That would be the nickel end of thing. On the iron end of the thing, they're easier to magnetize, but it's easier to lose the magnetism too. Okay. Today I'm not going to talk about that, but just in case, okay? The ferromagnetic core, if you want a really closer to make a permanent magnet, get some nickel in that alloy as well. Okay, but if you want it soft it turns off easily, keep the iron. The current carrying wire is wrapped around the core and what you've got to be very careful is, is that you wrap it the same way. If you ever stop and start wrapping the other way, it's going to cancel it out. You don't want that to happen. Okay, so the current carrying wire is wrapped around the core. That ferromagnetic core. Uh, the field is enhanced by the combination of the ferromagnetic core and lots of coils around there that makes it stronger and stronger and stronger. It can be turned on and off like we talked about. Turn on the juice, the strong magnet, picking up a whole tractor trailer to trailer, you know, moving it on, turn it off, it's no longer a magnet, sets it right down. Now that's not the only place we use those. Okay? Um, just about everything we use these days are digital, right? But have you ever seen some of the ohm meters and amp meters that were actually an error that went back and forth? In that you had a, down here somewhere, you had an electric magnet. When you turned on the juice, then it attracted, or not attracted, the spring took it back to zero. Okay, so when they say meters, ohm meters, amp meters, volt meters, all have those in them. Now, the analog ones, the digital, you have to. Switches, for instance, the switch in that, if that's some sort of thermostat in there, the switch is an electromagnet. Always have a little electromagnet somewhere in it. Speaker, yes. Is it? Oh, how sad. Okay. So <laughs> uh, let me just finish this slide. Oh, well, I don't think we'll finish it. No, we'll start over with this one next time. Electromagnets. Um, all right, this is approximately page 160. Applications of electromagnets. Okay. Thank the lab, if we don't turn it in by Tuesday. It's Tuesday a week away. 
Uh, it's Tuesday that would be part of finals week and everybody else, but for many term courses, the Tuesday of finals week is the last day of class. The Thursday is when the final is. Uh, yes, yeah, her dad came by yesterday and said her bronchitis is still bad. She wouldn't be back till next week. Yeah, sorry about that. But thanks for covering for us. Okay. What was I just saying? All right. I didn't want too many people to leave yet. I want to give you your lab before you go so I don't have to carry them down there. Uh, we're going back to 150 or 253 as long as no biology class is in there. If they are, we'll be in 252 if no one's in that one. Uh, the equipment's in 252 because there was a lab in 253 and I couldn't put it in. Um, so, get, why don't you take a break? We didn't, haven't had a break today, so take a little break and, uh, and we'll show up there. Keep it less than five minutes if you can. Okay. I'm going to pause. All right, we're recording now. Okay, we've got four, four people per team, which is really pretty nice. Uh, please read the first page. If you haven't already, read it sometime. Okay? On page two, you'll see the setup. Okay? Now, that's what we've got here with one exception. Our exception is the voltmeter is in the uh, power supply. So we don't need a separate voltmeter. But I do have the ammeter in line with the circuit, as you see there on your thing. The A with the circle around it is the ammeter. The voltmeter is what you will read on the, the scale there. All right. Now, on page 194, part A, known resistance. I put a known resistor in your circuit here. And what I want you to do is... You adjust the DC adjustable power supply, and I'll tell you how. So turn it on, the red button, and then shoot for, whoops, shoot for, one volt. Looks like there's maybe a trick on the little see if that happens. I'm turning the wrong way. Okay, I'll let you do it. Okay? Yeah. Okay, what you do, and, uh, yeah. Now, what you read on your ammeter, depending on which ammeter you've got, the one that we have here is on the 20 uh, millivolt range. So that would be 7.64 millivolt. I mean, milliamp. Okay? You have your meter, you have to tell me. Okay, you got yours. That's in milliamp, right? Okay, you got yours. What's that on milliamp? Okay, so that's what you record, except your data sheet is on page 197. Not 198, 197. Okay, and you can go on what I want you to shoot for here, your voltages, one volt, two volts, three volts, four volts, five volts, and six volts. Okay? But your current, notice, is said in amperes. What you're reading, listen up, what you're reading is milliamps. So you have to move your decimal to make sure it's in milliamps, not amps. So someone had a 7.78, that would be point zero zero no, yeah, point zero zero seven eight. If you had 11, that would be 0 .011 something. If you had 9, .00951. Okay? So convert it. Be sure you record the current, not in milliamps, but in amps. Is that understood? Everybody listening? So record it in amps. So just take your measurements. As close as you can get to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 volts. If you don't get it, if it varies a little on you, get as close as you can. 6.1 or 5.3 or whatever, as close as you get. 4.9, whatever you can get to. Okay? And when you get all those done, then let me know. If you have any questions, let me know. I'm going to put this on pause for right now. Readings. Voltage and current, right? Yay or nay? How y'all doing back there? 
We're working on it. Okay. Okay. So when you do something with the uh, resistor, when you wipe. What'd you say? At the bottom where it says resistor. Okay, wait, what would you say? We need to wipe. If you've got all your things, turn off your things so that we don't run out too much. Okay. So what you got is your data. All your data. Okay. It says you'll adjust the DC voltage supply. We're reading on page 194. Uh, and then record the value of resistor. Okay, I'll give you that in just a minute. And the six values for current and the data table, 12, uh, 22.1. You did that. Okay. Now, I'll tell you, are y'all, have y'all got your first one done? Yes. Okay. All right. What we're going to do right now is jump over to uh, the results. We're going to skip the unknown resistor for right now and go to results. Make a graph of the six data points in table 22.1, placing the current on the horizontal axis and the voltage on the vertical axis. Now I want you to give me about your ranges of those things. Yeah. Okay, let me see those. Y'all tell me if this is about right. You're going your voltages from 1 to 6 approximately. And your current, this one I'm looking at here, is going from about 0 0.007 or 8 to about 0 0.05. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Um, so you've got a bigger span. This is going from one to six. That's going from six to from seven to fifty-four. Because that's when it changed. You told it changed in the two. The first we were at forty nine. Yeah. And we were putting two zeros, right? Right. We were putting two, and then told it to put one zero. Right. That's correct. Okay. okay. How's that? Well, wait, okay, wait, 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 okay. Okay, this had two digits before the decimal. That's point zero one six two. Yes, that's correct. That's the only one you got wrong there. Okay. That one right there. You don't just put two zeros, you move the decimal to three places. The decimal was between six and eight or two. And move it three places, it can put it right there. Okay. So what you do and it looks like for your your group, those numbers are good. You're going from about seven or one. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, right. Yeah, right there. Okay. Right there. okay. Now, yeah. so what I, if I were you, I would put it in and do it on the first graph page. I would put your. It doesn't really matter. So whichever way you want. If you want to do it this way, then your horizontal is going to be your your. Uh, it doesn't matter whichever way you want to do it. The horizontal, however you do it, is going to be your current. But for current, you'll put um, point. See your currents again. Okay. Point zero zero. Okay. So this will be point zero one zero point zero two zero point zero three zero point zero four zero point zero five zero. Okay. And your voltage will be zero one two three four five six. Okay. Yes. Okay. Are you going to do your graph? Okay, and then put point zero one, point zero two, point zero three, point zero four. Okay. Now, also I have. Oh, I forgot to bring those over. Wait just a second. Hello. I 
six data points on the data table, placing the current on the horizontal axis, the voltage on the vertical axis. Okay, once you get your best straight line through your data points, then uh, calculate the slope of that line. Y'all remember how to do that, right? Uh, of course you do. What is slope? Right. Rise over rise. Okay. If you have any trouble doing the graph, let me know. I'll be glad to help. So I got on the first one, the current I got point zero zero. Point zero zero seven. So that would be right about there, and go there except it's actually closer to 8, so it would be right there, and go up to whatever your voltage was. Uh, yeah, yeah that's, that's pretty good. Yeah, big circle, you get it all. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank The biggest slacker in our class. You gotta approach it with a slow glass and not this one. Slow the
Okay, has everybody got that done? Sorry, I forgot to turn off the uh, thing. Everybody got your graph done? Oh, okay. They're working on it. Anyone have any questions on the graph? Can we see them? Y'all got through? Yes. What, what, yes. One more. One more. One more.
Have y'all got a number yet? And 
In other words, it's what the difference was. Since you're dividing by 100, multiplying by 100, it's whatever your difference was. That's the percent. I had a higher number. Oh, I'm sorry. I had a higher number. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Where's your answer? I don't know. I just got to do it again. calculated percent error okay now I'm going to give you a new resistor a new resistor all the same okay and do the same thing okay are we going one through yep okay but you'll find any questions, please ask. All right. Do we need to round those numbers? I would use the digits that show up on the thing. Okay. And then you do the same thing as you did before. Here is uh, repeat procedure A with number on and draw three. Before it's there, you make a second graph this time using 6 data points from 7 to 8, that's just 22. Again, placing the on the horizontal, voltage on the vertical, uh, calculate the slope right here and somewhere on the back. So just like you did before. Is it bottom yet? No, no, yeah, I was, that's what I was trying to ask. Yeah. How about I maybe go from 2 to 4? Yeah. No, okay. Again, you're doing amps. Now, these are million. Right? And you're doing amps. So that would be point zero zero two. So um, basically, we're going from two to fourteen. Oh yeah. We're going over there. Okay, you want to do it which way? Same way you did that one. This is okay. current. Well, current this way. Okay. So that was. 
two to fourteen. So zero point zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, point zero two, point zero four, point zero six, point zero eight, point zero one. No, no, okay. Yeah. Or we point, three. point point one. No, point zero zero two. Point zero zero two, point zero zero four, point zero zero eight, point zero zero point zero one zero, point zero one two, point zero one four, and that's point zero one six. Your numbers fit in there. Yes. Whoops, the wrong one. This one. Yeah. Or one four. Yeah. So everything fits in there. All right. So kicking around at a half people. Okay. Got it done yet? How are y'all doing? Okay. Again, if you're through taking measurements, what do we do with our devices? Okay, any questions before I turn off the project, uh, recorder again?